Welcome to Real Talk in ELT, the podcast that talks about the reality of teaching English. Another episode of Real Talk in ELT. It's just me today. Um, and I've got actually today, I ha- I'm going to record this episode um, in dedication to the Mind, Brain, and Education uh, event that was done with Dr. Ingrid. Finger or Finger? I'm not sure exactly how to say it because I heard both in the the webinar, so I'm not um, I'm not sure exactly. So I apologize, Dr. Ingrid. She was amazing though. Um, and then tonight, I'm going to get really geeky um, with uh, Andre Headland and Rudy Machiel. Uh, so I've I've got all sorts of mind brain education things going rolling around in my head. So I was like, well, you know, I'll just do this episode too. Uh, so this event happened gosh, weeks ago. And I took, I, I want to show you if you're watching, I took literally four pages of notes as this woman was just talking. It was literally an hour and a half. And I just, I have four pages of notes because everything she said was just spot on and interesting. And, um, yeah. So let me go through a couple things, uh, that she went through, which I thought were very interesting. Um, trying to raise awareness a little bit. Um, because I'm all mind, brain, and education today. Uh, I got a lot of things that I've been doing. First of all, I've been reading this book, which is the Making Classrooms Better for the Mind, Brain, and Education Study Group. Want to give you information from Dr. Ingrid and all the insights she gave us during her all the Viva style um, uh, webinar event from the MBE SIG. Um, and then tonight I'll be geeking out with my two master nerds and, and all things MBE. So let's jump into it. So, um, this was a fantastic event and it was, like I said, it was set up like a Hoda Viva. So if you're not familiar with that format, um, because I wasn't, uh, <laughs> obviously it was not something I was familiar with. Um, so the way that it works was, uh, they, uh, the MBE, Uh, board members invited Dr. Ingrid as a guest and um, they, uh, some of them, mostly (laughs) Rudy, because he's out of control, had a list of questions, um, but other people did like Sinji and and Luis, uh, there was other people that had questions. Um, And uh, Hoda Viva is just that you have the person there and the, they interact with the audience. So, you know, they start talking about a, a topic or somebody asks them a question about a topic and explains it from their perspective. And, um, yeah, it's very interactive and very dynamic. It was wonderful. So we started off between the differences, uh, the differences between bilingual education and bilingual programs. Uh, she wanted to make it very clear that bilingual education. I'm sorry, I have it notes here, so I'm going to be looking down. But uh, bilingual education or curriculum is when regular schools are teaching content and improving proficiency in the second language. The focus is on teaching the content, whereas bilingual programs are regular classes that develop English. So the focus is the language. So there are two different things, and sometimes people use them interchangeably. Um, I can understand why they would they would exchange them, but okay. Um, then she jumped into some common myths or mistakes um, that we don't need to teach English because math and science will be taught in English. And she just was like, wrong. First of all, she's adorable. Like she's like the sweetest looking woman. She's like wrong. She's very opinionated. I loved her. Yeah. The whole thing about her. Um, so, uh, her opinion on this and obviously this is based in all of the research and everything that she does. Um, is that we need to teach English and content. So math it needs to be developed in the academic schools, but also we need to give students language for being able to explain the reasoning behind it. Um, and, and that academic skills are not necessarily transferred from one language to another. So we have to build those language skills up. Uh, then she went into a little bit of basic interpret BIX, sorry, is the acronym, basic interpersonal communication skills. Um, so, uh, those are like normal English classes. She, she related to normal English classes, which is good, but it doesn't help children do the, with the math or reading skills or, yeah. Um, so actually, Hanata and Samantha, if you haven't seen the, 
the video that I made with Hinata and Samantha at Breast Tiesel in July, they were also talking about VIX. So I think this is something that we need to start um, to make uh, more common uh, in our conversations. Um, what's next? Sorry, I have to go through these notes. <laughs> Y'all know I don't get very prepared. This is very unscripted, by the way. All the episodes are. So then um, there was a study done in Brazil about cognition of people. Da, 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 da. Oh, I think this was actually Andre had asked a question about this. I'm not really sure, but if people that uh, are, they go back to the language that they learned. The, nope, no, nope, no. Nope, this was her talking about it because there was a question about this. But um, there was a study done in Brazil that when people are asked a question uh, about a con content, they actually go back to the language that they learned that content in. And her example was giving change. So um, if, if, if you're at a store and you're, you're buying a product and then you're, you're giving change to somebody, or, you know, doing the basic math skills, basic arithmetic skills, that you're actually going to go back to the language that you learned that skill in. So if you're a Brazilian Portuguese speaker, probably you learned how to do basic math skills in Brazilian Portuguese. And the reason for that is that um, the brain is always looking for the fastest response time. So faster means easier in the brain. So it's always just going to refer back to that. So this is why if we're teaching content, we also have to teach the language for that to, to try and make it a little bit faster. That's what I interpreted from this. I could be a little bit wrong, but it was a really good example. Um, and then also stronger emotions contribute to more uh, of how much we learn something. So Especially, this is why we have people who have traumas. It just blocks them out. They're not able to, um, to deal with that. Then there was a question from someone. I forget who it was. I apologize. I should have written it down. But um, to look at the differences of the terminology that people are using. So bilingualism uh, or bilingual, uh, plural lingual, multilingual, polyglot. <laughs> And what's the difference? Because we have to start using the right um, the right terms. So bilingual, two languages, we use it to define people. Plural lingual is mostly used in Europe. Plural lingual and multilingual are used in Europe. But plural lingual is used to talk about people and multilingual is used to talk about a context. So like a, an area or a situation. And in the United States, as opposed to... Um, Europe, because Europe tries to make it all complicated. In the United States, we just say multilingual to talk about people or to talk about a context. Um, and polyglot is something that, ooh, my notes here are a little sketchy, so I'm not sure. Uh, it's something about academia. So either people don't use that in academia or they do use that in academia. Sorry, I didn't, my notes are not super clear on that. My bad. Um, then we went into um, oh, uh, executive functions, uh, which I think we don't use the name executive function anymore. I think we use it cognitive mechanism, but I wasn't sure because this was like where it starts to get like oh, I haven't studied any of this and I got really anxious about it. Um, but anyways, they're talking about a study uh, or an article. Uh, there's a 2004 study about cognition and bilingualism. Oh, I have a note here. Ask Andre. Like, I want that study, please. And thank you, sir. Um, but then in 2001, there was something established called the bilingual cognitive advantage where we use um, the cognitive mechanism for everything, and it controls uh, inhibitory control, cognitive flexibility. Sorry. Oh, God, these notes got real. She was probably speaking fast, and I'm just like, I don't know any of this. I'm writing it down quickly. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, there's pretty much there's a bilingual advantage hypothesis um, that bilingual children show executive functions earlier um, and it, or, or early and when you're aging bilinguals have a faster response time than monolinguals so um 
Oh, I under, uh, yeah, I remember what she was saying. She was saying that we, if you're a bilingual, if you speak multiple languages or if, yeah, uh, if you even not are highly fluent in one, but you just are starting to learn one that you are exercising control over which language to use all day, depending on a context. Um, and I really identified with that now that I live in Brazil, I speak English in my classes, but then also I'm, sp I'm speaking Portuguese when I step out the door, but my husband's Brazilian and he speaks, he speaks English with me, uh, in the house and we speak English to the dog. But as soon as we go outside, he'll speak Portuguese to people, but then he'll speak English. It's a, it's like a mess. So we're identify greatly with this. Um, <laughs> so, um, a bilingual experience throughout your life means that you exercise language regulation. Um, it's the new, oh, that's the new term. Language regulation is the new term for executive functions. And you have um, attention, which is the mechanism that regulates uh, proactive and reactive control. All of this is done in the frontal lobe of your brain. And when people have, oh, oh this was super interesting. Just like reasons that people should speak multiple languages, that uh, when people have dementia, the first symptoms for bilinguals start about five to six years after monolinguals. So if you speak a second language or I have started learning a second language, you will, if you are one of the people that gets dem dementia, that you will um, show symptoms later than monolinguals. However, um, in the, when they were talking about Alzheimer's, they were looking into Alzheimer's in the, the damaged areas in the brains of bilinguals. Bilinguals have much more extensive damage than monolinguals. So when they study the brain after the person is deceased, the, there's extensive, like significantly more damage than monolinguals. However, um, the cognitive reserve delays the symptoms, uh, but the de decline happens quicker than monolinguals. So what happens is if you know a second, if you have, if you're a monolingual, you only know one language, then you will show symptoms earlier and your decline will be slower. If you're bilingual or multilingual, <laughs> if we go to Europe, uh, multilingual, or plur sorry, plural lingual is what they say there, or multilingual in the US. If you speak more than one language, um, then you won't show symptoms. You'll show symptoms five to six years later, but your decline will be much more rapid, which is, I think it's such a, it's like such a cool thing. So like you're just kind of staving off that period of dementia and Alzheimer's and um, obviously just horrific diseases and cognitive decline and um, so yeah, so you're, if you're destined to get it, you're still going to get it, but you're not going to show the symptoms until much later. And then it just, it, you decline much quicker. Okay. Then, uh, oh God, <laughs> uh, hang on this page. Oh, Okay. Rudy asked this question and I have to ask it because it was a very long question. I think he had three questions embedded because it was like getting to the end and he wanted to get his questions in. <laughs> well, then, no, he was, he was kind. He, he wanted, uh, anyways, uh, I, I think Louise asked a question too. And then they were just kind of, they, they, they asked five questions for Dr. Ingrid. She was like, <laughs> um, but it was about, uh, language and age. Um, uh, the idea of, uh, the critical period, et cetera, et cetera, that cr the, the critical period theory. So, um, what she had said was in, in terms of acquisition, which I'm not even sure if we're using acquisition anymore. I know that second language acquisition is that there might be another term for it in the very near future, but, um, it depends on quality and quantity of exposure. And the production depends on your perception. So aging interferes with phonology because it's a functional problem. It's a physical problem. So, um, and this is very interesting and something that I've been looking into, especially because I'm preparing this weekend for um, a workshop on teaching adults and some of the physiological features and some of the things that happen as an adult have 
consequences in the, the, the language classroom. So we have to think of that. So, um, so again, aging interferes with phonology because there's literally a functional physical problem. As we age, unfortunately, we start losing uh, hearing and uh, it's not as acute as it is necessarily. Um, the critical period doesn't exist. <laughs> we Now we see it as a sensitive period. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Ingrid, for clarifying that. Um, and that the brains continue to learn throughout life because plasticity is always a bit available throughout life. Plasticity from the way that I understand it, I could be mistaken, uh, so feel free to make comments if necessary, but plasticity, the way that I understand it, is the brain's ability to make neural connections and uh, strengthen those connections so that they become automatized in the future. Um, so that's the way that I understand plasticity, but I'm not sure if that's exactly correct, uh, but Google it. And um, so plasticity is always available throughout life, meaning that we have the ability to learn throughout life, However, age affects uh, when it, 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 they'll play a factor, meaning uh, loss of hearing, sometimes loss of eyesight, uh, cognitive decline and things like that. I mean, if you have, you know, whatever. Um, the one thing that she said, which I hashtag loved, and I wrote down exactly the quote that Dr. Ingrid Finger said, was bilingualism is a spectrum of experience that varies a lot. But bilingualism is an experience. And I liked that idea, I like that perspective of it. Um, so we should see everyone as emerging bilinguals because more or less everyone around the world, with the exception of maybe that isolated tribe off the coast of India, you know, that's on the island that they, <laughs> they've, I mean, I'm, this is horrible to say, but I think they've killed a couple people because they've tried to like, well, one of them was a reporter, which was silly. I mean, I, whatever. And then the other one was trying to convert these quote unquote savages to Christianity. So, you know, uh, anyways, uh, with the exception of that island and that tribe, everyone has an experience with another language. I mean, it's so international. It's so global now. Most people have access. It's very rare that you don't see anyone or you meet somebody who has not had minimal exposure to, um, to a, another language. And, uh, I believe that the term that we commonly hear here in Brazil is a false beginner, but, uh, she used emerging bilingual. Um, so because everybody has this experience, uh, they can function in a relatively specific context. Okay. Um, uh, the last stuff. <laughs> um, I did write one thing down, which I <laughs> loved. I don't remember what this, this note was in reference to. The differences in networks in the brain is in perception and production. Oh, I remember because it's related to this little, this little note up here, which I underlined because I thought it was funny. She said trash crash and <laughs> um, sorry, <laughs> inappropriate, but yeah, uh, because there's not like a center. Anyways, his theory on something was wrong and it was just, I giggled to myself as she said that. Um, so memory is a result of learning. There's different types of memory. We have declarative memory, which is more about vocabulary and it's possible to be exposed um, one time to something and that can actually just go into procedural memory. And procedural memory is grammar. So this is something that we need to practice. Um, there was someone, Michael Ullman, Omen, uh, um, um, I don't remember his last name. I wrote like very quickly and it's messy here, but there was how uh, something about how memory systems support second language acquisition. Um, and it looked directly into the declarative memory and procedural memory, which is something that, uh, again, all of these things, they sound very technical and they sound very scientific. However, it's something that we need to consider because if, we, if, the memory systems support second language acquisition, then we need to know how the memory systems work. Um, and uh, so we have to do a little, at least basic investigation of those. Um, our memory is also modulated by emotions. So um, that, 
additionally plays a factor. And then I, I was, I said some, I wrote something here and I'm not really sure why I did, but it says applied to adults, the procedural and declarative memory. Oh, um, because adults are constantly monitoring themselves. And so they kind of have this awareness of, you know, things that they're, they're doing, but also that, um, because we do have a, a tendency to, as we age, um, again, this goes back to the critical age period, which again, is the sensitive period. Um, and plasticity, that whole idea is that, you know, adults, children might be exposed to things and it might uh, go very quickly from declarative to procedural memory or uh, I, long term. I don't, ooh, uh, maybe I said something wrong here. So I'm not going to edit it though, because I never edit these things. Um, uh, short term, long term memory, I think is what I was think anyways, uh, then for adults, uh, we might have to think about possibly having to re repeat things and do more repetition with them so that it actually becomes, um, fixed in their long-term memory. Anyways. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Here, here it is. Ah, I have notes on this because procedural memory develops faster for children there's typically more plasticity with children and they're more carefree about errors. So, um, and that's why for adults who are constantly monitoring themselves and sometimes overcritical and sometimes have issues about making errors and the plasticity it has lowered just due to natural aging. So yeah, so there's that whole thing. Anyways, um, yeah. So Michael, I'll have to find the reference for the, the person who wrote a, uh, paper or book about how memory systems support second language acquisition. That was the amazing talk with Dr. Ingrid Finger, thankfully put on by Breast Teasel's Mind Brain and Education Special Interest Group. Um, it was wonderful. I had such a great time um, because a lot of this stuff, it's uh, I've been digging into it a little bit um, just for my own personal development, but uh, it's, it's fascinating. And, and I really do love this idea of the, um, mind brain and education fields where there's, they've connected, you know, multiple disciplines to, to really try to get to the bottom of learning. So, uh, I highly recommend joining either the SIG or the study group or buying books like this, like <laughs> making classrooms better, uh, doing something along those lines, because uh, really it's, it, it's, it has made me stop, reflect and reconsider some of the things that I've been doing in my class, uh, like my, my classrooms and my teaching practice and thinking about how I can better serve students, um, especially adults with some um, psychological, physiological changes that they're going through and a better understanding of the process of learning. Um, so quite interesting. Um, and that's my reflections on that. So Dr. Ingrid Finger is in Southern California right now. Um, and she's doing a study there, but she is involved in lots of things in Brazil. Um, and I'll try and see if I can steal her bio from the MBE people so I can put it into the, the show notes here. Uh, so you can read a little bit about her and she does have a project, um, or a research project here in, and I think a lab too, um, in Brazil. Um, so if you're interested, then, you know, follow or search and, and, and try and, um, learn more about it. It's great. Uh, that's it for today. Uh, that was just my little reflection on the things that I learned while sitting in the, the, the webinar or the whole the Viva, I should say. And it was fantastic. Uh, I'll be back with more episodes and more information. Talk to everyone soon. Ready to join the conversation? Head on over to Instagram at Kelly Pennington ELT and send me a message. That's it for now. Take care of yourself, your health, your vibe, and your tribe. Until next time.